Good morning, everyone. So nice to see you all. So my name is Craig, and it's a joy to serve on staff here at Riverside. It is fantastic to see you all, and just welcome. If you are visiting uh, with family, if it's your first time here, we are just grateful that you are with us this morning, and to everyone that is online joining us. And we're excited for this Christmas sermon, and uh, we've been building up to this. Uh, in many ways, this is the, the culmination of this whole year for us. As a church, we have been seeking the presence of God more and more in our lives. And this has been a big deal for us, and uh, this Christmas series that we have been uh, preaching through has been encountering the presence of Jesus. And we've been looking at how people were able to posture their lives in such a way that they encountered God in an incredible and powerful way. Uh, postures like humility and faithfulness. And we're going to do that again this morning, and I'm excited for what we are going to hear from the Lord. So kids, there's also in your packs, I think there's a bracelet that you guys can start working on and listening uh, as you listen to the sermon uh, this morning. But Christmas, th this has really been a season, and uh, as a young family, our kids have been getting more and more excited about Christmas, and maybe you've been experiencing this as well, and we've been doing a lot of waiting this December. So uh, something about our house, uh, in our kitchen, we, uh, it's one of the higher cupboards out of reach uh, from all the short people in my family, uh, is where we keep our snacks and treats. Do you guys have a, a, a treat or snack cupboard somewhere in, in your house? Yeah, I'm getting a few nods. We then also try to do a little bit of damage control in Christmas by a few months ahead, we start to put things into that cupboard uh, for Christmas. But then you see what's in the cupboard. And so there is a lot of temptation because, Dad, when do we get to eat those chocolates? Sorry, guys, uh, we're saving that for Christmas. You know what uh, that's like. And so there's all this building and all this waiting and all this anticipation. And now there's a calendar on the, the fridge and it's the, okay, eight more sleeps, seven more sleeps. And this is just this building and all this looking forward to as we count down to Christmas. How many of you guys had advent calendars where you were opening something every single day this Christmas? Any of you guys had some advent calendars? One or two hands going up, even some of you adults. That's a, amazing, guys, as we get excited about this. One of the things that also we did a little differently this year that's brought so much anticipation is we uh, handmade carol, uh, crackers for everyone at Christmas lunch that we're going to after, after this. And it's just so much excitement and joy as we've been preparing for people this uh, Christmas season. And that's what this is about. Even the word Advent, the, the definition of Advent is the anticipation of uh, a significant person or the waiting for the arrival of someone important. But not all waiting's fun, right? Hands up if you love waiting. Nah, man, I know you. <laughs> right? Uh, a little while ago, we embarked on uh, the task of getting passports as families. And uh, there was an issue during that season with e-home affairs. And so we had to do old school waiting. So I did a little bit of research and I heard, no, go, go to a smaller town like Heidelberg or, or something like that. The queues aren't so long there. And so uh, we embark on the efforts to, uh, we go to Heidelberg, we go park, and I'm looking, and there's like lines. And I joined the back of the queue and I asked the guy, how long have you been waiting? His answer was, since yesterday. <laughs> Turns out there were two queues. And the one queue is you wait the whole day to get the tag. And then you had to come back with your tag. And I'm like, no, Jesus loves me. This won't, won't be so bad. At about six hours, I bailed out. Man, because waiting, waiting is terrible, right? None of us like queues. None of us like the delays and everything. I mean, you're going on holiday. How many times have you guys heard that, are we there yet? Because, and I mean, this is a, 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 analyzing this with some kids shows. 
Have you ever noticed in movies and kids shows, if they're going to travel from one place to another place, how long does it take them to arrive there? Instantly, right? And that's like warping and ruining our ability to take time to get from one place to another because everything we watch, all the media we consume, when people travel, it's just like they blink and they're there. So those are like, like silly things. But some of the things that we end up waiting for are a lot more serious. And as challenging as life is at the moment, some of us are waiting for, for some pretty hectic things. Some of us are waiting for a, a change in our jobs. We're waiting for a change in our financial situations. We're really uh, waiting for some change to happen in our health. Uh, some of us, it's not been great waiting because we've been waiting for a painful phone call as we've been waiting on some loved ones that are, are in a very serious health position. And so that's what we're going to really dig into today. Today we are going to look at someone who waited really well. And in waiting well, they experienced a significant blessing. And that person, and so guys, if you've got your kids in your packs, you're going to see some of you have got there where the name of the person is. You're going to write that down now. That was the person of Simeon. And now that's interesting, because Simeon, you don't find him much in, in the Christmas story. He's actually uh, quite a quiet figure. Um, you can ask your mom or dad to help you with the spelling, but if you do wait just a few minutes, you're going to see some verses, and you can look for his spelling and his name in the verses uh, on, on the screen. But in the Gospel of Luke, Luke places a large emphasis on Simeon, and we're going to see the powerful encounter that he has with the Lord and how he waited, and we're going to learn from that. So if you have Bibles, Luke chapter 2. And from verse 22, we're going to set the context, and then we're going to learn about Simeon. So Luke 22 to 24. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it was written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. We're not focusing hugely on Mary and Joseph uh, this morning, but it's just an incredible and beautiful context that we see as we learn about Simeon. Mary and Joseph are being obedient. The law required your firstborn, you bring him to the temple, and you made a sacrifice for your firstborn. The standard practice was a lamb. In the Old Testament, and in particular Leviticus 12, uh, we learned that if you couldn't afford a lamb, you could take a pair of pigeons. And we know there's a lot of those around, so it wouldn't have cost someone a lot of money to still be obedient to the Lord and make necessary uh, uh, sacrifice for them. And, and this is just such a, a stunning picture about God and Mary and Joseph, because this is public, right? The temple was where everybody went to during that time. And when you gave and you made the sacrifice, people could see. So if you didn't bring a lamb and you only brought the pigeons, everybody knew, hey, maybe you were quite a poor family. And this is Mary and Joseph, and who are they are bringing to the Lord? They're bringing Jesus. And they couldn't afford the main sacrifice. And they could only bring two doves. And so the family that the lamb of God came through couldn't afford a lamb. And they were poor but also trusted God and were obedient to Him and still followed through in a very public way just with a pair of doves. Just such a beautiful thing about who our God is and how He came into this world. And so while that was happening, from verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, so there you can find the spelling if you need to write it down, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him, and it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Now that phrase, the consolation of Israel, seems quite a big phrase uh, for us this morning, but what he was waiting for, and what that means was, the promises in God's Word for him 
all of the promises of the Old Testament, he was waiting for. Because God had made some promises about Israel, his people, his country. But as he was living, they weren't being fulfilled yet. They hadn't come true yet because Israel had other people ruling them. They were Romans and they were soldiers and they had to uh, bow to them and, and follow their rules. And so as someone who trusted God, when it says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, he was holding deeply in his heart that all the promises of the Old Testament were going to happen. And so God saw that and God gave him a promise He said, Simeon, you will see my Messiah, the Lord's Messiah. You are going to see it in your lifetime. What an incredible promise. And he then responds. So verse 7, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for what the custom of the Lord required, Simeon took him into his arms, praising God, saying, Sovereign Lord, As you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations. Light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. That's so interesting because he hears the promise and he's moved and he goes to the temple where he starts to wait. So verse 33, the child's uh, father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a son that will be spoken against and so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now there is so much going on in this and uh, we only have time to really focus in on Simeon and so, uh, also in your packs, uh, kids, if you've got notes, this is the, the first point that you can write down this morning is this, waiting is part of our faithfulness. Or you can say waiting is part of what it means to trust God with our lives. Because Simeon in verse 25 and 26, he's described as righteous and devout, And so we wouldn't expect someone who is righteous, who ticks all the boxes of being a great Christian or someone who trusts God with their whole life to be found still needing to wait for a promise in his life. That goes against the culture of modern Christianity, what we see with TV preachers, because you're supposed to be experiencing all of God's blessings now. Right, like the TV show, what do you mean you're waiting? Why isn't God uh, giving you what is promised? What's wrong with you? And we live in this uh, culture that perpetuates this thing that everything has to happen now. Uh, The convenience, right? We don't have to wait in any queue. If you don't wanna go to the shops, you can just order online and if uh, there is surely some delivery service that's in our radius that will bring it to you within an hour and so we never have to wait. We never have to uh, spend time trusting and enduring while the thing that we're trusting for arrives. It happens really quickly. We even have tracking apps where we can see just how far uh, the, the gift or the parcel that we've ordered is and you can even go onto the maps and you can Like if you've ordered a Bolt or an Uber, you know, you can actually go on and you can see what street the guy's in and, you know, and it tells you, you know, one minute, 30 seconds, one minute, 26, as you, and we just live in this world that rejects waiting. But what we love and learn about Simeon is that it is part of our trusting and our our, uh, faithfulness because he was righteous and devout and had to Wait. Look at these verses. Lamentations 3, 25 and 26. The Lord is good to those who hope in Him, to the one who seeks Him. Verse 26. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. See, I love how this whole encountering God is counter to what we get taught by culture. It is good to wait quietly quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Psalm 27 verse 14, wait for the Lord, 
Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Now, there's a difference between passive waiting and active waiting. Passive waiting is a bit more negative. Ah, man, my life is terrible. I just can't wait for something better to happen in my life. And passive waiting sits around and just is what it is. It's just waiting, but you're groaning, you're angry, you're discontent, and why is this happening? And just something better must come, and and, and we're thinking the whole time about if only this happens and this happens, and God must just do this or this, and then my life will be better. That's passive waiting. But Simeon does something different. He does active waiting. Right when God gave him the promise, what did he do? He went to the temple. And he went there every single day. And we don't know how long he did that for. But every single day, and, and I wonder if it was like, well, is this the child? Is, is this the child? Man, is today going to be when the, the, the promise is fulfilled? Am I going to see, see the Lord's Messiah today? But we don't see any like groaning or any frustration at the waiting, he received a promise, and he actively put himself into the place where God was going to move, all right, it was the temple. That's where you bring the firstborn child, that's where you go to consecrate, so he knew that's where I was going to encounter the promise, and so he actively waited by putting himself in a position where he would experience that promise. And it's very different to just sitting around and moaning that this hasn't happened yet. He took a step into the promise to actively wait for what God was going to do. And this is important, because he would have done this every day until the promise was fulfilled. And he actively waited every day till its completion. And there is something Uh, It says something about anticipating God's activity in our life, that if He has made a promise, that I don't get angry or frustrated or dejected like maybe some of you are, but that there is some value in me leaning into that, well, it hasn't happened today, but that doesn't undermine that God is still working and that He's going to work powerfully in my life, even if I see the fulfillment of it in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years The timeline between the promise and the fulfillment doesn't undermine God. It doesn't undermine you. And it doesn't say something about your worth before the Father because here was a devout, righteous person who was given a promise. And it was okay for him to wait every day actively and seeking the Lord and finding, is it going to be today? And actively leaning into that. Second point, if you guys are taking notes, is our flesh doesn't like waiting. What we mean by our flesh is, is, uh, is we get angry when we have to wait, right? So um, I think Steve has mentioned a similar story like this, but this happened to my family about two weeks ago. Uh, we really are enjoying this Christmas season because Inez's younger sister, who lives in Belgium, is visiting us, and we don't see them very often. And so about 10 days ago, they arrived from Belgium, and we were uh, making a big effort to get to the airport to see them when they came through international arrivals. Uh, They've got some kids that are my kids' age, and so they miss their cousins. So there was a lot of excitement around getting uh, to the airport. But we live in the south of Johannesburg, and uh, those of you who know, know Uh, what you have to navigate to get from the south of Johannesburg to the airport. And there is some intersections, and uh, I'm convinced that N3, where you take that off-ramp, it's the R21, and uh, I reckon that it's ended some marriages. (laughs) Now, I, um, I don't like being late. I work very hard at controlling the things that I can control. I work very hard at putting time boundaries uh, and margins in with my family to give us the appropriate time to get to where we need to get to. But we got stuck behind a truck on uh, the N3. And um, I'm also convinced that uh, in every relationship there is one person in the marriage who doesn't mind cutting 
And there's one who are like, no, this is where you take the turn off and we, we must do what is right so we don't perpetuate the problem. I won't say who's who in, in my marriage, <laughs> but I was convinced that I pulled off too early. And I counted 200 around or so cars that cut in front of the truck in front of me. Around about 200. And I'm watching on the GPS how the time is changing from when we're going to arrive at the airport. And I know when they're going to come through that gate because of their landing time. And then we're getting the messages on our family group. Yay, we've landed. And we haven't moved. And I can feel my blood pressure rising. I'm sure that if you look at my steering wheel, that there's some indents from, and Ines is going, Craig, we're going to get there. And I'm going, no, you're not. She's like, it doesn't help getting angry. I'm like, well, I've got to do something. And I don't know if you've experienced that level of impatience. And I was raging. I have to admit, I don't think I've ever been as worked up in my life. But Ines was right. We were going to get there. What, what, what did impatience help in, in what I felt was like seven days? She clarified with me this morning that it was only 40 minutes. And I think she's lying. But it helped no one. It certainly didn't help my family, who were getting more and more worked up at, as I was getting worked up. It wasn't helping anyone that I was getting shorter and shorter with my patience and conversation in the car. But where has impatience ever helped anybody? And really what impatience does is just bring out the worst in all of us. It certainly brings out the worst in me. And it really reveals just how much our flesh hates waiting. And so here's the third thing. And this is our third point is our waiting is satisfied in the person of Christ. And we find our joy then in the person of Christ. Of Jesus, and that's what we see so much in Simeon's story. Let's reread verses 29 to 32. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, for which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation for the Gentiles, and a glory for your people Israel. What was the word? that Auntie Jody had for us in the presence box. Can any of you kids remember the word? Presence. Presence was what the words were. Not presence as something to unwrap, but the presence of Jesus was what Simeon rejoiced in. There's a picture, uh, an incredible painting by an artist called Ron uh, Di Shiani. And this is a, a, a painting, and it's called Simeon's Moment, and a recreation of what it must have been like for patient Simeon waiting to see the Lord's Messiah. But who's in his arms? It's a baby. It's Jesus, but a baby. And as he picked up the baby, he rejoices in God's salvation a revelation and light even unto the Gentiles, that as he holds the baby, he is experiencing the presence of God in his life. God's salvation has come as he sees with faith and as the Lord reveals to him that in this baby is the light and revelation, not only to the glory of Israel, but even unto the Gentiles, and he holds it in his arms and he rejoices and he says, God, you can dismiss me now. He, he doesn't see the cross. He doesn't see the resurrection. He doesn't see the full fulfillment of, of everything. But just receiving the presence of God in his life is enough for Simeon. Isn't that just incredible? He doesn't even get the full picture. He doesn't experience the, the complete end of the promise, just the baby in his arms is enough for him to rejoice in God. 
And this is where we talk about we want God's presence, not God's presence. Because we want the gift giver, not the gift. And in our culture where we always think the reason we are in a relationship with God is so that our lives can be fixed. This world is, is so temporary and things are so dynamic that that's the, a, a terrible way to view God. And I love what St. Augustine says, is you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. I'm going to say that again. It's a wonderful quote. You have made for us, you have made us for yourselves, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Inez and I, we try to do a mental exercise on trying to remember uh, what we got for Christmas over the years. And we couldn't. There were maybe one or two years where we're like, yeah, I can remember that and that. But things like gifts are so temporary, right? But not the presence of God, which is eternal. And when our joy is found in the presence of God, when our desire is for Him above everything else, and when we are able to posture ourselves to desire and receive and wait for that, we are going to experience tremendous, tremendous blessing. And as I said, seeing baby Jesus in His arms was enough for Simeon. The presence of God but I know that um, so many of us are, are trusting for very real things. Uh, band, you guys can actually come up and start getting yourself ready as we're going to close off and, and pray in a minute. And it's okay to keep desiring um, these things. In and of itself, to trust that the Lord will give you a promotion and you will make some headway in your company and the resulting benefits for your family and those things. It's okay to trust for your health and, and see that the God is going to bring some restoration and healing and, and experience a, a, a greater uh, lifestyle that comes from, from better health. Those things are okay. Keep trusting God for those things. But never put your hope in those things because they're temporary. What we're learning is what we need to be waiting for is Him the giver of the gifts, and to wait for as long as it takes to experience that and to be trusting God for that in our lives. So what's the word? The word is presence with the C, not presence with the T. That I want to experience His presence in my life. And can I wait for that? Yes. Yes. Waiting is good. And in the waiting, God can do that and bring about fruit in my life and the fruit of the Spirit of patience as I experience God, as I trust Him for Him. Let's pray. Jesus, I'm so thankful that in our fast-paced, dynamic, and difficult world, you call us to something different. You call us to reject the immediate gratification and satisfaction that, that we're seeing around us. And you call us to a different pace. And God, as everything in our flesh wants to rebel against waiting, Holy Spirit, would you produce that fruit in us that we can learn to slow down our hearts and our minds, not want to fix everything around us, but to maybe go, God, what are you wanting to do in me that I need to wait for? And that I can posture myself into actively waiting for you to move. As Simeon had faith to see that, would you, Holy Spirit, increase that faith in me to trust you when things don't seem to be happening? 
And especially this morning, I want to pray for all of us that are feeling quite dejected, maybe discouraged and a little bit beat up because it's not been a good year. And you've maybe asked the question, but God, are you even, even there still? That maybe in this you would realize actually God is at work and I need to continue to wait. And that waiting is a righteous act. And that as an act of devotion, I'm going to wait on you, Lord, for you to move in my life. Thank you, Jesus, that we can trust you. Thank you that you are alive and that you are moving. Thank you that we can trust you. And God, help us to experience your presence in a way that we never have before. In your holy name.